back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Give apes the vote. You won't regret it. We've got that story. Plus a little bit of interesting action going on in the Asia Pacific. But first, you can't get dragged kicking and screaming into the brave New World Order without kind of killing off the past first. Sears has substantial doubt about its future. Sears, that back-to-school shopping destination for a generation of kids, has said after years of losing money that there is substantial doubt it will be able to keep its doors open. But it also insisted that its actions to turn around its business should help reduce that risk. It was still a dramatic acknowledgement from the chain that owns Sears and Kmart, which has long held fast to its stance that turnaround is possible, even as lots of people have all moved on to Walmart, Target, or Amazon. Sears has survived of late, mainly with millions of dollars in loans funneled through the hedge fund of chairman and CEO Edward Lampert. But with sales fading, it is burning through all that cash. Sears Holding Corp said late Tuesday it lost more than $2 billion last year, and its historical operating results indicated doubt about the future of the company that started in the 1880s as a mail-order catalog business. And the story goes on to kind of add in the human interest angle where there is Older citizens who basically said that we've always shopped there. They bought everything there from the time they were younger to even to this very day. James, I dug back on MediaMonarchy.com and found uh, among numerous amounts of stories just about what has been called dead malls. A story going even back to February of 2009 on MediaMonarchy.com. Get ready for mass retail closings. So we've seen it coming for a long time. When they were talking about it in 2009, it was all related to the Great Recession. But now, nearly a decade later, it's not only the Great Recession, but just the massive, massive changes that have happened. James? Well, I think that's it. You just hit the nail on the head. It's changes. I don't think... I mean, I'm not going to shed a tear for Sears, uh, not just in the sense that I don't care about the big corporate behemoth, but also in the sense that this does just reflect a change that has taken place and is certainly taking place in the way that people shop. And I don't, I mean, again, I don't think that's a fundamentally horrible thing. It's just what we do with this. So it's interesting. They start out as a mail order catalog company. Well, they should essentially go back to that, but the 21st century equivalent, which of course is online, which is where people are increasingly doing their shopping. Now, I suppose there are two things that are about that. One is the loss of the sense of community space that we had in the shopping malls and going out for a shopping experience. But that was a contrived reality that was created by the the sort of economic factors around it that made all of our interactions with everyone around us economic at base. So I don't know if that's something that we should weep the the losing of. Maybe we should find ways to interact with people in real life that doesn't involve economic transaction solely. Um, But secondarily, I mean, the other part of this is, of course, retail jobs, which are being lost and will continue to be lost as people continue to buy more and more online. You do not need as many clerks to walk around the stores if the stores are all online. And uh, increasingly, if drones are going to be delivering things, you don't even need people to deliver them for you. So that is the way of the future. That is something that's significant and that we're going to have to, uh, again, continue finding um, uh, other solutions to. But I don't think the answer is to have more malls and to have more retail outlets. I mean, this is this just is the changing of the way that we are doing business. And uh, again, I'm not going to shed tears for Sears and Kmart. I guess I can be kind of a nostalgic guy. I like, you know, like old time radio and old movies and old jazz records and all that kind of stuff. So I think there is that little bit of sort of that loss of past. But you also in your first point, I kind of like the idea that it could, you know, I mean, it's it's weathered you know, 130 years of changes, the idea that it could go back to sort of being a small kind of craft boutique and could actually in some ways regain some kind of cool cachet in some ways. Again, not like I'm going to go to work for them on their marketing, but (laughs) it's just sort of thinking about, you know, just these just these massive changes. And again, everything we say will always be included in the show notes, including that link back to the 2009 story. And I think it's always interesting to look at some of these dead malls and there have been photographers who have done, you know, series of photographs that show deserted malls, ceilings caved in, filled with animals and snow. And there are these kind of eerily beautiful things. And I suppose that's maybe the way we can just wrap up that first story for this New World Next Week, episode 303 for March 23rd, 2017. Our second story, 
Chinese landmark concept put into UN Security Council resolution for the very first time. The Chinese concept of building a human community with shared destiny was on March 17th incorporated into a United Nations Security Council resolution for the first time, mirroring the global recognition of China's great contributions to the global governance. Also included in the newly adopted council resolution was China's Belt and Road Initiative, which aims to build a trade and infrastructure network connecting Asia with Europe and Africa along the ancient trade route. In a unanimously adopted resolution to renew the mandate of the UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA, for one year, the 15-nation UN body urged to promote security and stability in Afghanistan and the region to create a community of shared future for mankind. Meanwhile, the latest council resolution also urged further international efforts to strengthen regional cooperation and implement the Belt and Road Initiative. The Security Council stressed, quote, the crucial importance of advancing regional cooperation in the spirit of win-win cooperation as an effective means to promote security, stability, and economic and social development in Afghanistan and the region to create a community of shared future for mankind, end quote. Since China first proposed the concept back in late 2012, it's gone on to shape China's approach to global governance, giving rise to proposals and measures to support growth for all. James, this sounds fantastic, doesn't it? It's just, a, a, again, a brave new world order, right? Yeah, yeah. I guess now that it's in a UN Security Council resolution, we can all dust our hands. Everything's over. History's over. You know, we've reached the common goal of humanity. Um, yeah, well, hmm. but I, I, this is an interesting story in a number of ways. First of all, for what it does portend about the role of the of China in shaping the UN-led global world order. Very interesting on that perspective. It's also interesting as a peek into the UN AMA itself, the assistance mission in Afghanistan. Why is the UN in Afghanistan? Oh, that's right, because NATO tore the country apart, invaded and occupied it for, you know, 15, 16 going on 17 years. I mean, however long they need to be in there. Um, absolutely ridiculous. But also it shows that China is taking a more active role in Central Asia and moving into, for example, the sphere of influence includes maybe Afghanistan a little bit. I think that's uh, one of the aspects of this story. The other aspect is something that's pointed out by Peter Lee of China Watch over at Newsbud, who um, points out quite correctly that the interesting use of the win-win phrase, which sounds like just a kind of everyday political speak, but in the Chinese political context has its own meaning, is imbued with its own history and meaning. And we can get a sa sample of that from a report that was just up on the Japan Times a couple of days ago about did America's top diplomat inadvertently offer China a new great power relationship? Talking about uh, some of the catchphrases that uh, Rex Tillerson was using when he was talking to Xi Jinping, like um, building on uh, non-confrontation, no conflict, mutual respect, and always searching for win-win solutions. And they quote a, uh, a director of the International Security Program at the Lowy Institute in Sydney saying, these innocuous looking set phrases are imbued with coded meaning by Chinese officials. Hence, mutual respect implies recognition of so-called core interests and even implicit endorsement of a new model of major power relations. So these, these little code words have real meaning to in the at least in the Chinese political context, and they're managing to slip them into UN Security Council resolutions. In their mind, is a huge diplomatic win. It means that people are looking more like, oh, okay, China can be this global driving powerhouse in the international um, arena, and their version of win-win and mutual respect and all of this is now being encoded and enshrined in UN law. So there's a lot going on under the surface of this story. Obviously, I'll throw in the link to that uh, Japan Times article and also to the uh, Ch the China Watch uh, episode from Peter Lee, where he talks a little bit about that win-win phrase and what it really means, but. A uh, very interesting story, and it, it peeks under the hood of a number of different things that are going on in global relations right now. It does, and as you know, as I, I call him on the Morning Monarchy, Rex on Tillerson, making the voyages all around the world. And I mean, inadvertently, that seems that seems hard to believe that he would inadvertently use a lot of their sort of dog whistle catchphrases, right? Yeah, it does seem oddly uh, suspicious. We'll put it that way. Okay. Well, the other Chinese story that we'll include as a related is one that really caught my eye, so, so to speak. Beijing installs toilet paper dispensers with facial recognition software. So somewhere between... 
maybe putting up a sign saying, please don't use so much toilet paper, or installing something as this article will include, basically says something a Bond villain would do. So I think that sets us up for our strange third and final story on this New World Next Week, episode 303, Should a Chimpanzee Be Treated as a Person with Legal Rights? An attorney in a court in New York says that a chimpanzee should be treated as a person with legal rights. So they answer that question right in the right in the outset. Attorney Stephen Wise argued last Thursday before a state appeals court in Manhattan that two chimps named Tommy and Kiko should be freed from cages to live in an outdoor sanctuary. Kiko's owner, Carmen Presti, says his family at an upstate Niagara Falls, New York sanctuary isn't letting go of the deaf chimp he and his wife rescued 23 years ago. Attorney Wise must now wait for the five-judge panel to issue their decision. That could happen in a matter of days or weeks. Wise represents the Non-Human Rights Project that has filed lawsuits on behalf of the chimps in various New York courts unsuccessfully so far. So we shall see what comes of this case. But James Wan, it makes me think of The Simpsons with the funny billboard in the future of giving apes the right to vote. And you won't regret this at all. But it also reminds me of the recent video you put up where we're getting these glimpses of generally a horrific future. And we have it's it's catching sight of that. And it's probably scaring a lot of us, whether we're sort of realizing it consciously or it's just those things that we're kind of noticing and kind of filing away. And each thing gets a little stranger as the time goes by. So, James, what do you, any, any thoughts? I don't know that we really have much to comment. Maybe we'll see what happens when the case comes out. But. Yeah, I, I think it's just I think you're right. This is obviously a glimpse of something that's uh, that's going to be coming at us a lot in a lot larger way in the future. But I think it's another example of one of those stories where the kind of basic underlying idea of it is something that appeals to people. Well, we, you know, non-psychopaths generally would say, yes, we should treat animals more humanely more with more respect uh, we shouldn't you know treat them to in in torturous ways or whatever just you know for our own kicks and everyone has that underlying sense they don't want to be cruel to animals but uh now trying to encode that in courtrooms in the law i mean clearly this can go very bad very quickly when people start representing the animal sphere in the courtroom and uh, who gets to speak for the animals and in what way and how will that be applied? And and then is that lowering the human rights status of humans and things like this? So um, I think when we start to bring in the court sphere of it, I think we should all be skeptical, even if, I mean, look, I have nothing against people who are for animal uh, better treatment, but I think doing it in the courtroom is not the right way and it's going to be used against us as a weapon, as pretty much everything else that are that goes into that sphere of criminal justice ultimately does. I'm just reminded even as we're sitting here talking about it and, and you know, in some ways what isn't a weapon is the fact that lots of people, again, feel just as you described, stopped going to SeaWorld. And that's why circuses have gone out of business, which uh, I talked about on a recent Good News Next Week episode. So there are ways to sort of put these things aside. And again, there are ways to be nicer to all living things all around you and actually I'll probably go into that a little bit more on the morning show tomorrow as they've seen these kind of strange cannibalism memes really kind of going around from CNN to all the new movies in the theater and that's you know again I think a really important interesting kind of disturbing conversation that we kind of have to have so having said that, James, <laughs> let's at least have some little bit of good news. I published my latest episode of Good News next week for the first day of spring as solutions are springing up all around. And it's got great ideas about simple ways that we can crush crony cartels and, again, build community and do all of the things that in some ways hopefully we're laying out in these episodes. Just to drive that point home a little further, I wanted to find at least another bit of new good news that wasn't included on that recent episode, and I found it using hashtag good news next week. Man picking up North Carolina trash for 20 years for free almost every single day for the last 20 years. Terrell Jonas has walked up and down Mount Holly roadsides in North Carolina, putting on a yellow vest and picking up the trash that everybody else throws out. I kind of like this story, and I think it goes along well with last week's story about the Portland anarchist road care that you don't be told or you don't have to be forced by government to do things. If we do things because our heart and our mind and our community all lead us that way, then that's just going to be that success 
So, James, hopefully we can wrap up this episode 303, hopefully on that kind of positive kind of outreach community oriented note. And I will throw in a, a humorous related link to the uh, to a samurai cleanup crew in Tokyo that uh, you have to see to understand. But anyway, it's not so uncommon I think at least in Japan. I don't know what's common back in North America anymore because I haven't lived there for a couple decades. But <laughs> I think the idea of community cleanup is not such a strange thing and people just doing that voluntarily because they want to keep their communities clean. Again, that's something that all of us feel, so it shouldn't be that surprising when we actually see people doing it. But at any rate, we do need people who do it so that they can be the leaders and examples for others. But anyway... On a completely different note, let's wrap things up for this week, James. I appreciate the stories and the time. Uh, I hope people will check out the Morning Monarchy uh, podcast every morning to keep uh, up to date with the latest news. That's going to do it for this week. See you next week. Thanks. Take care.